Hello, and welcome to the Anime Explorations Podcast. I'm Alex. I'm Tori. I'm David. And it is October of 2023, which means it's the start of the fall anime season and also the start of the spooky season. Um, so, as part of the fall, start of the fall season, are you watching any new shows this season? New shows? No, not not yet. I watched okay. Jujutsu Kaisen. She's it's catching, to yeah, she's <laughs> catching up on that. You know, it, it's a battle Which, of anime that's appropriate to the spooky season. So yeah, that's... It, it, it started its uh, third season. No, no, it didn't. Rising of the Shield Hero, which I'm catching up on, has just started its third season. Jujutsu Kaisen's on two. Uh, uh, catching up on a few... on the. Uh, new seasons of a few shows um the actual new shows i'm watching so there's the um uh Fearin, uh beyond journey's end which is really good um also will really get you in the feels um i definitely had a few i'm not crying i'm not crying i'm totally crying moments within the uh first few episodes when it um launched um there's also the sequel series to Initial D, uh, MF Ghost, uh, which is instead of being a drift rate, uh, underground drift racing, it is actually illegal uh, track racing. Um, so that's uh, well, not track racing, but like legal street racing on closed streets, as I guess that's how I describe it. Um, and there is, we have a new anime about making things also this season, a 16 bit sensation, another layer, which is about making, uh, Bishojo visual novels in the mid, uh, nineties. Oh, wow. <laughs> that fits in neatly with, uh, the last thing we watched and <laughs> yep. I don't know. I like that kind of show. Yeah, it, you gotta know how the sausage gets made. Like, it, it parti- the, it particular, the premise of it is it's a person from modern day who works in like making visual novels and that sort of thing as an artist who gets shunted back in time to 1992. Um, <laughs> wow. There's a very specific flavor of isekai. <laughs> so the funny thing is, like, so we're on episode three now. Um, she's actually got bumped back to the future and then back again to the past one more time. Um, though in the past, this used to 1996. So we're getting a degree of advancement of technology and that sort of thing. Like the first episode, the, the first game she's working on is, um, made for like the PC 98, like which is a 16 bit PC basically for MS DOS. Um, so we're having to work with like six, uh, 15 colors and that sort of thing. Um, and then for the current arc, they're on. She's in 1996, so Windows 95 has just come out. Um, <gasps> oh my gosh. The game changer. As yeah. someone I, who's, whose life has spanned these landmarks in technology, that makes me smile. God, what would it be like to watch a show like this as uh, someone who was born more recently who had no idea? <laughs> like, <laughs> yep. Uh, apparently the um uh manga this is based on um the, the writer had gotten um basically consulting on this from people who worked at aqua plus who did like uh comic party and utawari rumono and that sort of thing um and too heart so um people who have definitely done games throughout this whole span of time so that that's it's going to be interesting. Um, and like, there's actual like licensed visual novels like showing up in there. Um, awesome. uh, visual novels cool. and Bishojo games and that sort of thing. Um, so it, that one's so it, that is a, definitely a very interesting show. I'm um, do you want looking to, forward to? Sorry, do you want to just explain super quickly what a visual novel is? Because this is something that I've only become aware of in the last I don't know 
five years um, as its own like genre. Yeah, seriously, I didn't really, I didn't really cotton to this until pretty recently. <laughs> so visual novel. So- used to be that what visual novel publishers would do to compare it to was they compare them to choose your own adventure games in terms of a story with lots of writing and a branching narrative on that sort of thing with like lots of use of art and that to help illustrate the story and so forth and so on. They stopped doing that because the choose your own adventure people have a trademark on choose your own adventure and they are very litigious. Um, But that comparison to that particular type of branching narrative book is the like a really good comparison to use in that you're dealing with these narr- with a story that branches off into different chunks and some of them have very have bad ends some of them have good ends um I'd also kind of draw a bit of a comparison here also to the like fighting fantasy game books uh, or lone wolf and that sort of thing because some of these games like for example the Utawari Romono series um will include RPG elements to it with the Water Mono as a tactical RPG to it. Um, the Rants series, which um, a- adds a dungeon crawler RPG to it. Um, some of these games are smutty, like um, again, smutty. Rants is the entire Rant series is porn, full stop porn. Um, and some of these games are not, um, like the more recent. Um, Utawari Ramono games um, like they have risque content but they do not have explicit sex scenes um, some and some of these games started out as porn and moved to a not porn version um, the Fate, uh, Fate Stay Night is a great example of this the original game was a porn game and well it had sex scenes well yeah it, 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 right, it had but... I'd say it, it had explicit sex scenes yeah um same with um, Tsukehime. However, the later re-releases removed those. Um, and some of the cases with these, it's depending on the era, the sex scenes are there because they were expected. Um, one of the comments I've seen about Kiyoko Nasu's uh, sex scenes in like Tsukehime and Fate Stay Night is they feel like they're there because he was obligated to put them in there. And he recognized that he wasn't very good at writing them. And so when they re-released them later, um, in addition to removing them to fit requirements for say a console release, he also removed them because then he is, because he, he didn't like them very much anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I feel uh, like uh, th- there's a, there's a lot of modern American anime fans who don't really pick up on visual novels as a genre. Um, Some of them are great. Some of them are bad. Some of them are (laughs) cringy, just like anime. So you do have to kind of take them on their own merits like any other anime show, but it is cool that they're interactive. Yep. And it it helps that like, the genre, like much as with the adventure game, never really went away. Um, like Danganronpa and um, uh, Chaos Head and um, all of and that whole ser- branch of series, Steins Gate, are all visual novels. And there's a fairly substantial number of them available through uh, Steam and that sort of thing. Would you say that it's pretty common for really popular visual novels to get anime adaptations or OVAs? Um, yes, actually, I would, I would say so, um, that when a novel gain visual novel gains a certain degree of success, it will get a release. Even like back in the day, the, um, smutty ones would get a, or it would get, would get a smut, a hentai adaptation, um, with varying degrees of quality yep. or lack thereof. Um, and occasionally we'll get a situation where you'll get a, uh, like, you know, the girl who shouted love at the heart of the world, which started out as a smutty visual, as a porn game, got a porn anime adaptation, got remade with the porn removed, and got another adaptation of the non smutty version. Proving once again that stories are king. Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't think this is a wild opinion of mine, but I prefer porn with stories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
But enough it, about that. I mean, <laughs> it takes all kinds. Also, I'm, yeah, let, let's just move on. <laughs> no, I can't talk about this. That's a whole kettle of fish. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, speaking of other recent stuff, so we also had a uh, Disco Tech Media Disco Deck Day release, uh, or announced a whole bunch of announcements. Um, we have uh, of the notable stuff: um, Magical Girl Lyr- Lyrical Nanoha, the original series, is getting a Blu-ray release. Uh, that got like a very limited Funimation release back in the day, and like a streaming release on Amazon Prime, but not much after that. Um, we get a bunch of like '90s and um, speak to Bishojo stuff. '90s Bishojo anime, like we got Handmade May getting a re-release, Dual Parallel Trouble Adventure getting a um DVD release, um, Futakoi, which watching the trailer for that is kind of weird. It's like it's a harem anime, but with pairs with like. Pairs of twins, multiple pairs of twins, <laughs> as opposed it to, the to next some, level. <laughs> as opposed to, it's like, it's like the direct line from like please twins to Futakoi to like quintessential quintuplets, I guess. <laughs> um, and like probably the big one I think uh, in terms of like artsy films, and actually this relates to what to the show we covered last uh, month with uh, Shirabako is um 4k blu-ray release of belladonna of sadness are you familiar with that movie and its history it sounds familiar but i could can't name it off the top of my head so belladonna of sadness was meant to be the third of three films that were part of mushi productions this is the second anime studio started by osama tezuka um it was called anime rama release of like artsy anime films with also a degree of sex and sexuality to them. Um, this was kind of meant to be aiming to be something closer to like tonally something like the Virgin Spring or that sort of thing. Um, the problem was the first two releases that they did, um, Thousand and One Nights and Cleopatra bombed at the box office and it was not helped by the fact that the international distribution for those distributed them as adult films rather than art films. Um, So they did not find their intended audience. And so Belladonna of Sadness um, basically was the last, was there was getting made as the studio was going bankrupt and like getting really min. So they had to go like very minimalistic in a lot of respects because they were running out of staff and running out of money and all that sort of thing. And a lot of the people who worked on Belladonna of Sadness and stuck around to the end of at Mushi Productions went on to start Madhouse, which is what Mushihino in uh, Shirabako is based on. Um, but anyway, like so the comparison I'd make in terms of, not in terms of subject matter, but in terms of how like they do the minimalist visual style is there's a movie called Jigoku, which was put out by Shintoho Productions. It's for those who, those who are listening to this podcast to subscribe to the Criterion um, channel, it's on there. And, like, you can tell in that movie where, like, oh, they found out the studio was going bankrupt. They started really running out of money because that's where you, like, they do these very hyper-minimalist, very stylized sets for depicting Jigoku, the Buddhist hells. And it gives it a very strong and very interesting visual style. Uh, like, honestly, Bell Don of Sentence, it actually had been previously been for a time licensed for streaming by the Criterion channel. So this was one of those things where I thought, oh, this is going to get a re-release or that sort of thing. Criterion Collection might pick this up or Arrow Digital or that sort of thing. One of those labels that fo- boutique labels that focuses on art house films. So I was pleased to see that this getting a the 4K release from Discotech Media. Pretty cool. All right. And speaking, and so... I guess we might as well get into our spooky season material with Vampire Hunter D. So, this is my second 
time watching the movie and I've read the novel several times before then. Uh, what's, what's your experience with uh, Vampire Hunter D, the first story? Uh, well, the first time I saw it, uh, unsurprisingly, Sci-Fi Midnight, <laughs> Sci-Fi Channel at Midnight Anime, um, I thought it was really interesting. Uh, it's like, oh, that's great. Uh, it wasn't until a few years later when uh, Dark Horse started bringing over the actual uh, Vampire Hunter D light novels that I really got into the series because I had seen I had seen D a couple of times. I saw Bloodlust. Uh, really loved the visual style of Bloodlust, and that's what you know really got me interested. And I've read most of the series and the spinoff. Well, side story. I don't know. It depends on how you classify Grey Lancer. Uh, but I'm a huge fan of it, and yeah, I, 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 I love Vampire Hunter D. Uh, kickstarted the Message from Mars, uh, bringing that over, uh, which incidentally gorgeously illustrated. Mm. Uh, so I was familiar with Vampire Hunter D initially because of the illustrator Amano. Uh, because I went to art school, <laughs> everyone knew Yoshitaka Amano. Um, and, you know, I thought the illustrations were so gorgeous and baroque and evocative. Um, I have read the novel that the movie is based on. I thought I had seen the movie before, but I was wrong. I saw Bloodlust, <laughs> which is the second movie. Um, so this was, my, this was my first time seeing the film. Um, I could see... You know how it was so hugely influential on following works. Yes, and unfortunately, because it is, it, it makes some significant changes from the original narrative. However, the first novel is still suffers from that early installment weirdness that you get, in that D's character is not exactly pinned down to who he is yet. And that translates into the film where if you've like if you've only seen Bloodlust, D is very emotional in this film. He's more talky and emotional than he would later become, which I did not mind. Yeah, <laughs> it it definitely makes him more human, which given who D is, has the unfortunate tendency of making him less inhuman. <laughs> Uh, I think it's also interesting to look at this film in terms of um, what you were talking about just a minute ago where when they have to pick and choose in terms of what scenes to give their love to and where to stretch the budget. Um, there, there are some moments where the direction of the camera becomes very fundamental to the way the story is being told. And I think it's probably because they didn't have the budget to do more animation. So the, the camera direction became very important. Um, but I think they used that extremely well um, to push the storytelling in this movie, which is not always the case <laughs> Yes, when, when budgets are pushed. Uh, this, this movie also had the case of there's nudity just because it was expected that there needed to be nudity. <laughs> <laughs> But Not less than there is described in the novel. Yeah. Oh, also interesting. absolutely less. But at the same time, still out of place. It's also interesting to look at in terms of the greater world of vampire literature, vampire culture. Um, vampires are extremely interesting to mythologists and folklorists because they do pop up all over the world in different forms. Um and here you have vampire lore paired with uh, like a mishmash of genres. You have post-apocalypse, you have dying world, you have Western, just straight up Western. Um, and then there is still a little bit of that kind of Gothic romance that we in the West associate with vampires. So it is it's all thrown together. There's hammer horror in there. Um, <laughs> And so it, it's very visually interesting in terms of the genre soup that is being played with. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things like interesting when I was re watching this this time is I'd started reading uh, partially related to another podcast shelf by genre. Um, I started reading some of the 
um, Book of the New Sun by Gene Wolfe, and which is part of that dying earth genre. Um, and that's very much heavily played up in the novel. We actually get like partway through the book, we get like an interlude describing stuff in like the major cities of the world and that sort of thing and getting the description of this advanced technology that nobody knows how to maintain necessarily combined with vampires and mutant monsters and other horrors and that sort of thing in there. And we don't get quite the same impact of that in, um, in the anime film. Some of that's there where we get like your, um, the, your, ranch your your western style ranch with instead of a barbed wire fence or a wooden fence it's a force field fence with um with laser beams and crosses um, all over it yeah so it's very like we have that different take to it but or the, the genre mishmash but we don't necessarily get that the full explanation of that larger sort of sine wave arc of um, global collapse with a nuclear war and then um, reconstruction with the nobility, the vampires, and then the vampires are brought down and we have a bit of a societal collapse, but not as far as before. And there's a sense of rebuilding as the vampires are slowly getting uh, driven out into the margins of the world. There's an interesting argument that could be made as to whether this movie could have used more explanation of the world up front or not Um, because I could see it both ways I did feel like you were kind of thrown into this uh, genre soup what whatever happened to the world and then it does become a little bit confusing but because it's kind of peripheral to the main story it's not as important Um, but then also the fact that it does just throw you into this means that your imagination could really run wild like I could see watching this as a younger person and just my imagination lighting on fire from all of this going on. Like they have advanced technology kind of, but they're living in kind of a Western inspired town, but there is this crazy Gothic castle, but demons also exist and mutants exist and vampires exist. And it's just like everything. (laughs) Yeah. Anything could happen. Uh, There could be aliens and I would not blink. (laughs) Vampire Hunter D has an extraordinarily rich backstory that gets touched upon um, in e- pretty much each novel gets like little bits of what happens. Some have more, some have less. Um, all of the monsters, with the exception of the vampires, uh, the werewolves, the lamia, the all sorts of mutants, are in the world of Vampire Hunter D creations of the vampires in for one reason or another some as guard dogs some as just experiments that didn't work but get, but managed to escape it's great there was you know they had this enormous planet star spanning empire spaceships intergalactic or interstellar travel and it would all came about because Humans had a nuclear war that nearly brought them to the end, so the vampires stepped in and were like, hey, we're taking over. We're not going to let you endanger our food supply. You. (laughs) But does knowing that enrich watching this movie? It does to me. Yeah, it kind of depends on how you want it. But at the same time, if you don't know that, as you said, your imagination can run wild. And it's so great because... This film does have such incredibly strong visuals in, you know, and it very much, and it's very clearly is inspired by that Almano art style. Now it's, it's not as visually gorgeous as Bloodlust, but I think that's a matter of budget. <laughs> it's also a matter of 15 years of technological, technological advancement. Yes. Like it's Vampire Hunter D <laughs> came out in 1985. It's almost 40 years old at this point. Pretty awesome. Pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> it's also interesting you, you bring up the age and the visual style. It also bears mentioning the director of this, um, Toyo Ashida. At the same time he's working on Vampire Hunter D, he's also working on Fist of the North Star. Oh, snap. <laughs> yeah. Um, both the 
uh, television series and the movie. Like the movie came out the year after the um, uh, Vampire Hunter D did. So well, that's really solid directing because the vibe is 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 very very solid and very different in both pieces. But okay. the setting is not terribly dissimilar. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> I mean, like you and like the use of violence and that sort of thing is also very like, explicitly how gore is used in here is also somewhat similar compared huh. to like Bloodlust, where Bloodlust has bloody violence, but it doesn't have gory violence to make it to make a significant difference here. Uh, in this movie, D cuts open a monster and you see internal organs and scalp and eyeballs popping out and that sort of thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas um, in uh, Bloodlust, somebody gets cut in half and there's blood spray, but you don't see any viscera or anything like that. Uh, similar thing, particularly when you get to like the vampire, to the uh, Fist of the North Star movie. Um, which doesn't have to deal with content restrictions of television. Uh, you have more graphic violence and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Um, with with Kenshiro blowing up people's heads and other body parts. Um, but um, whereas with even with some of the later interpretations of um, Fist of the North Star, um, they don't have that same degree of gore. It's interesting to look at it in terms of the Western influences, because I would say this first Vampire Hunter D movie is more hammer horror pulp shock value in places, whereas Bloodlust is more gothic horror romance influenced. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, like straight up the hammer horror is there. The Count Magnus Lee is straight up named after Christopher Lee. Like, they, they were <laughs> not subtle at all <laughs> in this. And there's no reason to be. Like, Hammer Horror is as enduring as it is for a damn good reason. They keep trying to make it a modern cinematic universe without understanding why the originals were well, that, that's, yeah, delightful. Yeah, that, that's universal. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like you gotta keep the pulp, you gotta... <laughs> Like, you cannot make, you know, Wolfman, the Mummy, Dracula into a Hollywood blockbuster <laughs> and let it still be a horror film. <laughs> yeah, they, they are, like, there is with Hammer and also, for that matter, with, with Vampire Hunter D, there is a degree of schlock. Um, there is even, there is a degree of exploitation. Uh, particularly getting to the novels uh, and like, like with the reading the novels and the degree of, um, vi of violence and s heavy amounts of sex and nudity in there is it's not too far off from lots of exploitation of uh, exploitation cinema as well. Um, so we like, need to get you in your seat somehow. Yeah. Like, like if you were to do a, live action vampire hunter D it would almost like you would almost have to do like deliberately throw back 70s style matte paintings for your background shots and <sighs> and have that grindhouse level of film grain to it um, <laughs> like if you're going to make a live action vampire hunter D, I think the closest thing if you want to be like 100% faithful I think the closest thing you can do is like Caligula have a serious story, but you also go and just film sex scenes to put in there. <laughs> because butts in seats. <laughs> yep. Um, it is... I mean, we're talking about this movie like it had a, a lot more graphic content than it, it, it did. not. It did there, was a sour, there was a shower scene. <clears throat> there was, like, someone's blouse getting pulled down and like one other thing, but there was not very much. There was very little, I should say, uh, nudity in this film, uh, all female, and no actual sex. Right. Yep. Um. The books. Yeah, the books. <laughs> the books are yeah, the, the books. Very different. Um, like I will say, like related to this is based on a novel by Hideyuki Kikuchi. Like related to his other works, like um, 
it's I mean, he also did Wicked City, which is much more sexually explicit in its content uh, in terms of the anime adaptation. I have not read the novel. The novel is English translation of the novel is hard to come by now. Um, Tor Books published it, and it currently goes for hundreds of dollars on the used market. Um, with uh, Demon City Shinjuku, there's it's probably tamer than this uh, in terms of nudity, but um, yeah, it's, it's tamer than this in terms of nudity. So this is kind of in like that middle ground in terms of the animated adaptations of Kakuchi's work. Of um, this has probably the most graphic violence of any of the adaptations because also. I want to say there isn't that much gore in Wicked City, but it also has like the right in the middle in terms of sex, sexuality, and threats of sexual violence. Um, in terms of there's again brief nudity, there is a threat of sexual assault, but nothing happens. Um, so other things to think about, uh, talk about. So in the novel. Um, they play it really clever, quote unquote clever, um, about left hand, uh, D's left hand and that it's its own sentient entity. Um, looking in terms of, like trying to keep it a sort of mystery and that sort of stuff. Later books are like, yes, D, D's, D's left hand is a mind of its own and it talks and that sort of thing. It introduces it right off the bat. But here it kind of strikes an interesting middle ground where it kind of implies fairly early that D's left hand is indeed its own sentient entity and then but does it make as big a deal of it right it was very understated as mm -hmm. like you see him talking to his hand but it's framed and shot in such a way that he could have been talking to himself um and and then the hand comes out later to help him out and you're like oh i guess that's a thing because you're, you're just at that point in the movie, it, it, that's kind of what you're primed to do is just be like, oh, okay, that's the thing. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I knew about left hand going into the movie. I enjoy left hand. Um, left hand is, <laughs> in the series, a lot of... He's almost the comic relief character. Yeah. And he's the straight man. But it's not quite that dynamic. It's it's not yeah, it's not quite that dynamic. Like in the backstory, spoilers, left hand was given to D by his father, slash creator. It it does not explicitly say whether or not uh D was the product of or at least has not in anything I've read. And admittedly there have been a few books since I've stopped buying them. <laughs> Uh, it did not explicitly state whether or not D was actually um, the sacred ancestor's biological child, or if he was simply his most successful experiment. Because the sacred ancestor implied in the series, but not ever actually stated in the books, I think, to be Dracula himself. Although in the movie. Although the movie straight up straight says Straight up says it. <laughs> Yeah, um, Dracula is very much a mad scientist. He is trying to figure out ways to make vampires better. And a lot of the issues that D has r runs into are the results of his experiments. But at the same time, it's one of those we, like, D does not... Again, a difference in the series versus the movie is that in the movie, D kind of waxes philosophical about his dad briefly with uh, Larmica. Although she doesn't know he's his dad. In the books, D has a very negative opinion of said fellow. So Left Hand takes on this weird role of like part annoying sibling, part shoulder devil. Uh, part comic foil, part ex exposition machine, uh, <laughs> part just he's just very voice narrator. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> narrator because D is so taciturn and quiet. Exactly. <laughs> and he was explicitly put there to help keep D alive. 
Which he does. Yes. Uh, you, do, you do get a brief moment in the movie where uh, he gets to puppet the hand and run around, uh, you know, Evil Dead 2 style. Yeah, the hand gets cut off, so <laughs> it's now his own creature. It's one of my favorite horror tropes, the crawling claw. <laughs> Well, you know what they say, idle hands of the devil's spider. There you go. <laughs> oh god, that was a horror movie. That was like a... Well, I don't think it was a horror movie. I, I said yeah, horror it was, movie, but it was like more comedic. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I feel like the movie kind of downplays Left Hand as a character and plays him off as a plot device, which which is fine, because the narrative focus is not on, on Dee's uh, background, really. It comes up, but uh, kind of it comes up at the very end, just like in the book. I think the most interesting character in the movie to me was Count Lee's daughter, Marmika. Marmika is such a cool name. Um, she is designed and drawn very interestingly, um, and we think that she is, you know, a vampire slime of vampires, and she thinks that too. But then it turns out that she's actually a Dampier. Like Dee. It's unclear. Kind of? <laughs> it's unclear because Lee says, t- tells her that, you know, your mother was a human, but it's unclear if she was turned first. Right. So It doesn't really say. <laughs> it doesn't. But at the same time, if, if her mom had been turned, she probably would still be around. Yeah. So... So it, it, she goes through this very interesting existential Aristo crisis. <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> very quickly. Uh, um, yeah, and she kind of represents, she and her father both actually represent the inflexibility of vampires, or in a more wide sense, the inflexibility of beings that have been alive so long and are used to having things a certain way. Um, that they're incapable of change, you know. <laughs> you get set in your ways, and when you've been and when you've been doing those ways for thousands of years, you really get set in them. And uh, the catchphrase of Dracula's comes up a few times that they are but transient yes. guests, um, which implies impermanence, change. And that's obviously something that vampires have a hard time with. Or people in power, generally. Uh, (laughs) So it was interesting to see how she, as a character, grappled with that. And ultimately came to the conclusion that she was incapable of change. And she would rather die as she was. Um, So I liked that little little arc in there. I thought that was was, uh, interesting. (laughs) Who's your favorite character? I love D. Um, Fair. <laughs> D is absolutely my favorite. D has, been, has kept me going on for 20 some odd books. So, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's interesting seeing him in this early representation where he is more more personable. Well, it's not more yeah. More personable, more open to commun- more, more open to connection with others, but at the same time having to pull back, having to step back, and realizing that he can't actually connect to these people. He right. is but a transient guest in their lives. Which is rough, because he goes on forever, essentially. Mm-hmm. Who's your favorite, Alice? I, I like actually to a degree it, he doesn't get as much time unfortunately in this as he does in the book but like look Doris and Doris's younger brother Dan um he was are very cute in the movie. Yeah, he's very cute in the book <laughs> yeah uh, he's he's very cute in the book too and he gets a really interesting character arc in the course of the novel. We get a little bits and pieces of it here with like D talking about him, like, Hey, look, you need like, um, like you can, like you can cry. You can like, let, let, let this, let your emotions out. But if your sister's having a hard time with all of this, you need to be there for her and help her when she needs help. Um, and, 
him trying to do that the best he can. Um, probably, I think, I think of the changes from the novel, though, the one which kind of bums me out in terms of like a character getting shorter shrift is Ray Ginsey and he, in the novel is a very interesting character because he is, he has this like crew of basically mutant bandits. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it, it, absolutely. They're bandits. They are like, they combined Ray's ca- for the movie, they combined Ray's character with Lee's like chauffeur Garo, who is a werewolf and was in like one or two shots in the movie. But for the most part, got you know, and not even named there, but like the attendant, the watcher of Larmica, you know, making sure she doesn't do anything stupid, that's handed over to Ray. Yeah, like Ray in the novel is basically like like he had, he basically got like the wild bunch or um uh or the hole in the wall gang of like these mutant bandits, and they add and they add this complication this this basically third party to the conflict or fourth party depending how you want to count it um that complicates things further and adds additional wrinkles um and it and with how they're implemented in the novel it also gives an opportunity somewhat on accident but on doris's part for, for doris to significantly contribute to the net to the narrative and have her own action scenes and moments to shine, which she doesn't have in the same way in the film. Um, like, yeah, in the novel, Doris is very much just as she's in the film, the damsel of distress. But at the same time in the novel, she is, she is clump. She is shown multiple times being a very capable individual, capable of doing a lot of being sneaky and clever. Just, she can't fight vampires. Which is fair. Because, yeah. She's human. Yeah. <clears throat> the, if, even if this castle has only like recently reappeared, as I believe the town mayor states, um, these are humans who presumably are used to living near vampires, and so they would have you know certain strategies for survival. Yeah, it's... It's a little unclear in this film how long ago, or actually, it's not actually clear in this film that there was a human uprising, but how long ago that happened in regards to this story. I feel like they kind of hint on this kind of larger world building when the mayor is talking about how, you know, if they think a young woman has been uh, taken by the vampires or is slated to be taken by the vampires they have to essentially exile this person for the safety of everyone else in the town and yeah obviously that's horrible but uh it it also makes sense in the context of kind of this hard scrabble western look that they have going on in the town and the the kind of prospects of of survival as a whole in the face of an apocalypse and and vampires and god knows what else uh (laughs) So I thought that was a nice little bit of world building to include, even though um, the mayor and the rest of the townspeople don't really make a reappearance with the exception of his jerk of a son. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, although later on, uh, Magnus Lee straight up says, yeah, the last time they did that, I was so disgusted, I slaughtered the whole town. And it's like, okay, how how did they know to do that then? You, You clearly left survivors so they get the message. They just didn't get the message not to. I, I so in so in the subtitled version, like it's like half the town or like a quarter of the town or that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, so I guess that, must, that might be a change in the dub localization. It's actually my like, yeah. Like, well, I should to... say for this, uh, we watch we went with the new uh, Sentai dub. Mm-hmm. Worth noting, it's been brought over a couple of times. There are different versions of a dub. Yeah, the original version was. Um, was by um, Streamline Pictures and directed by Carl Masek, um, which who also directed like the classic Akira dub and Robotech and that sort of thing. Just um, to show you just how long ago that was. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then the recent one is from I uh, said that Filmworks. They for a lot of their stuff they have, but not all of it. They've redubbed it. If there was a previous dub, just probably for like budgetary reasons of having to. I mean, how much does it cost for them to redub the thing versus how much are they have to pay for 
residuals. doing yeah, re residuals for the old dub. Yeah, or maybe the rights were a little thorny because it's been so mm -hmm. long. Uh, it, it it's not like discotech where they will try to get every possible dub that they can pop that they can find for a thing um if they can get it discotech is good um because like for archival purposes you know the fact that they're hunting down these things and making them available in physical media is super important i think we talked a little bit last time about how important physical media is i'm so happy to be getting an actual high quality release of project echo like that that film has a very special place in my heart, and I'm just, I'm so excited for all the work they're doing. Like, a lot of it isn't super exciting for most people, but a, a good number of us do have associations with these very early, you know, 90s things that we haven't been able to see or to watch for decades. Yeah, I think that there's a big kind of attitude now, like, oh, I can just find whatever I want and stream it. And it's like, well, no, not necessarily. Uh, <laughs> physical media is very important. God, yeah. and that, that's one of the things we learned from the big uh, HBO Max purges is um, like... Fuck that guy. Yeah, uh, is, is like, some, is you, you think, oh, the streams could be around forever, but a license expires for somebody like... Uh, David Laszlov comes along and goes, nah, nah we're, we're going to get rid of that. You never got uh, to see Infinity Train. I got to see um, some like, I, I was like actually rather pleased and surprised that um, so uh, Crunchyroll had like co-licensed the, um, or co-produced the uh, Blade Runner Black Lotus anime adaptation and then and when that originally came out they only had the Japanese audio version on um on Crunchyroll, which is fine. But they had a, like a fairly substantial somewhat all-star dub for the English for the English dub, and that was for on the Toonami block. Um, but that was not available on Crunchyroll when um HBO Max started getting their anime division. And thankfully, um it looks like Crunchyroll managed to get the dub rights for those shows and like Blade Runner Black Lotus and put those on um, Crunchyroll as well. It's also interesting, um, as David said, if you have a particular nostalgic attachment to something that you saw when you were younger, even if they re-release it with a new dub, it doesn't give the same feelings. Like, as an example, I, I made David track down and purchase for me the original Fox uh, dub of My Name of Toto. make me. You, I saw asked you. The, you saw the original and, you're, and it made you sad, so I hunted it down for your birthday one year. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, because it's just, it doesn't hit the same notes. Similar to um, those of us who saw Sailor Moon dubbed on Cartoon Network as kids, that dub was objectively bad, but it hits this nostalgic place that cannot be replicated, you know? So. <laughs> And, you know, those things are hard to find now. They're expensive because they were made for a while and then they stopped. And there's, there's not going to be any more, you know, because of licensing. So it's just interesting. So sad. All this to say, let's get back to the movie. Uh, I, I feel like the, the dub that we watched at Vampire Hunter D was, was fine. Yeah, it wasn't bad. I didn't have any complaints. <laughs> it was well done. Like, it, it's kind of not easy to find just like a bad dub these days because it's not considered you know it's considered still like a good job you know dubbing um there are actual like titans in the industry now uh, yeah it's interesting watching modern anime now and just recognizing all the voices well, <laughs> i will say because they have you know actual actors who do this full time you do get to recognize their voices just in the same way that you recognize an actor's appearance, you know, a live action film actor's appearance mm -hmm. in something else. It's, it's actually, it, it's really nice that, you know, it's being accepted enough that people can do this as their job and you can recognize them. Yeah. I, I do also recognize that voice actors can and should get paid more. Yes. Um, God, off, yes. um Sag after. Appreciate yes, I, I support sag -Aftra, Um and I would like voice, and I would like 
sent Ty and Crunchyroll to take a meeting with SAG-AFTRA mm -hmm. for so can, even if they don't unionize, even if the actors working for them in Texas don't unionize, um, improved rates of compensation would be quite nice. Thank you very much. Very I would like, I would like this, these actors to be able to do this work full time because they do a great job. Um, and like, I think also part of it as well is like, cause like some of these actors who we have now, um, or who worked on this in the past, who like I mean, Steve Bloom had been doing dub acting for quite some time before he did, uh, Cowboy Bebop, but it's a case of, he was the first dub voice of Char Aznable way back. Yeah. Yeah, so he it's sure. <laughs> yes, he, back when they first brought over the uh, uh, movies in like '92, he was Shar. Um, and also, good luck getting your hands on that release. <laughs> yeah, um, but I think as has helped is um, I think there's been a better understanding of what the audience for these is for in terms of for like the dub directing and that sort of thing. Um, is like, I mean, to put this another example, um, I'm glancing at like the anime news network credit page and that's what they're talking about. English, like the English companies who worked on the U S release and mentioned for broadcaster, like for 1995 cartoon network was the broadcaster under the title of night of the vampire robots. Um, and I'm like, I like, I, as understanding, like, aha, this, like, this is the audience of the time of, like, of knowing how to treat this. Whereas later distributors and that's a no, like, no, this is Vampire Hunter D. This is part of this, like, big established work. This is the audience it's aiming for. And we will direct this, direct the cast with that in mind. I feel like it's important for the audience to know that as soon as you said Night of the Vampire Robots, David and I exchanged a look and we both kind of nodded like, yeah, we would have watched it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 1995? It's like, yeah, that, yeah. that was fun. Oh, oh, 100%. <laughs> it probably was a double feature with Robot Hunter Kishon. <laughs> Kishon? Yeah, that, means, that has been trans... That has been brought over in so many different ways. <laughs> yep. That was like, yeah, like... Sci-Fi Midnight Movies. Yeah, so like, it's it was the case of like, oh, this is... Like, the dub of this is being done not necessarily, like, on a high budget. Like, I mean, in context, Sentai Film Works and Crunchyroll are part of these big companies now. Um, Crunchyroll is a part of Sony. Um, Sentai Filmworks, um, even before the Cool Japan Fund sold out, sold their stake to AMC Pictures, they were still a fairly substantial punk company. Um, whereas back in the day, a lot of these were running like, I'm going to say fly by night operations, but very much on the cheap. Mm -hmm. Um, and even if you're like in a place which has access to a pretty decent acting pool. Uh, Central Park Media, you're in New York, you have Broadway and Off-Broadway that you can tap for actors. Um, they're not necessarily people who have developed the skill set for voice acting. Um, yeah. Even if they can hit their cues for ADR, you're doing ADR acting is very different from cartoon voice acting. And cartoon voice acting is also in a way different from anime voice acting because a lot of time when you think cartoon voice acting, you're thinking something aimed for a younger audience. That, yeah, that, that was always kind of my big complaint with the early, like, Disney Ghibli adaptations, is because they brought in, like, very famous actors who do great jobs, but they're not voice actors, so a lot of the performances, despite being by super talented people, because they don't have the talents in the right area, their performances were kind of flat. Like, I would have loved to have been a, you know, like, really a recording of, like, their recording job that they were probably doing amazing work with their faces, you know, conveying, but because in voice acting, all you can convey with is your voice. We're not getting some great voice performances. Yeah. Which is why I think like with like those Disney dubs, the comedic, the, the actors of the background in comedy are the ones who have put forward the best performances. Um, whether it's in the Disney Renaissance with Robin Williams as genie, or with the Ghibli dubs with Billy Crystal in 
Um, <laughs> in um, Howl's? Uh, yeah, Howl's Moving Castle. Yeah. Uh, going back to what you were saying about all these uh, not quite fly by night operations. I feel like the late eighties and, and nineties were um, just this period of great audacity in entertainment industries. Um, and I think we've lost that a lot. And a lot of that is due to the rampant capitalism and all of the smaller companies getting gobbled up by the big companies. Um, and the, the rise of sequelitis and multi multiversal franchises, I guess you would call them, based on things that have been around for a long time and were already popular, has swept into other industries like the music industry, where now they don't hire new talent unless they have a, like a hundred thousand Instagram followers or whatever. Like the companies have become so big and so risk averse that I, I really think that as the public, we need to throw our weight behind entertainment companies that are small, that are audacious, that are trying new things. I, I miss auteurship and I miss um, the willingness to take risk. And it's not that these things aren't out there. It's that they're not getting hype. And I feel like in the age of the internet, that is a, that is a terrible mistake that we can rectify. You know what I mean? I, I agree. Like, Part of, I think, with the complaint among anime fans with, oh, in new season, how many um, isekai adaptations based off web novels off of Naru with um, super long um, titles because Naru doesn't support um, capsule descriptions and tagging um, are there? Oh, about half to three quarters of the season because those novels, like people are grabbing studios are grabbing up novels or the production committees are grabbing up these novels because they think they'll do well or they have done well on the service and they're risk averse like to the point where to get to go call back to the beginning of the show um when we talk about Furin, like that's a fantasy anime with no connection whatsoever to a video game i mean it's adapt adaptation of a manga but it has no adaptation it's not a isekai light novel um it's not particularly game-based it does do the um have in its background the fight against a demon lord kind of thing but it's not like um it's like nobody's pulling up a stat screen with um in the game or that mm -hmm. in, in the anime to imply that this is a game or anything like that um and i so like in a, in a way while again it's adapting a manga and a manga that is on like published by Viz in the United States. So it's um, like, I want to say it's like, a, like Viz Plus or something like, like um, manga on the Manga Plus app. So it's not like it's uh, deep underground manga, but it's still a risk. And something like Vampire Hunter D, like revisiting that now, would in, also in its own way, like be something of a significant risk. Um, this takes me back to it because... Uh, I'm sorry to cut you off, Alex, but it's okay. talking about how all these, um, you know, the risk averse studios want established, already popular things to adapt because they think it's more of a sure thing. Um, I think there is a very interesting comparison that could be made between Vampire Hunter D and The Witcher series, because here in America, at least, people have started to look outside of America for franchises that they can adopt. Um, and so both Vampire Hunter D and The Witcher started out as a series of novels. Um, the novels didn't reach America for a long time because they had to be translated and licensed. Um, I think it's interesting that The Witcher is getting all of these adaptations and kind of having a moment here um, in American media. Although one could certainly argue that you know, the video games coming first paved the way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and Vampire because Hunter... Because they had an established audience before yeah. they were... And Vampire Hunter D is not. Um, and I think that part of that is... The Witcher is a little more uh, supernatural fiction, whereas Vampire Hunter D is obviously vampire and apocalypse fiction. Um, but there are so many similarities between them that I think I think the market could really enjoy a resurgence of Vampire Hunter D adaptations and re-releases here in America. But at the same time, the word vampire is so loaded 
in the media sphere. And I think America goes in and out of love with vampires <laughs> in terms of popular entertainment. I mean, there's an entire trope of our vampires are different. <laughs> like, so. I think also what, what hurts, like, to make the, the Witcher comparison, is the Witcher has, to a degree, a certain ongoing recurring cast. It's got, yeah, it's got it Triss, it's got Den- it has ensemble. It's ensemble. It's got Triss, it has Den- Dandelion. Um, and that sort of thing. You have these external characters in addition to Geralt who can fill these other roles of comic relief and lo- and recurring love interest and that sort of thing. Whereas D is like the closest comparison that like we made the Western um, brought up the Western analogies earlier, but he's like Clint Eastwood mm-hmm. in the Man with No Name trilogy. Exactly. Um, where also or in those three movies, he's also effectively a different character in each movie, or it could be a different character. He could be the same character, and he, because of that, he doesn't necessarily have the same degree of character involvement or development to him. I would argue um, that America loves that character, though. The plot- loves that lone gunslinger, lone samurai, lone taciturn man well the thing is we do love that (laughs) but it's hard to and while it's very easy to build a story around that character it is very difficult to build an ongoing narrative perhaps like in a novel it it's you know as the novels show it's easy because you know he's traveling but with like a live action series it would be a lot harder because there isn't that much emotional connection to others. But his movies, it looks great. Yeah, I, yeah. Like, I love the Vampire Under D movie. Uh, I really love Vampire Under D Bloodlust. They're fantastic as films. Like, you know, the Man of the No Name trilogy is so famous, and it worked so well, because those, you know, as movies, those things do great. I'm just saying, as an ongoing narrative, I think it would be difficult. Yeah. Uh, part of that is, again, the, the risk-averseness of... We want to have a even if we even if we don't do a cinematic universe, we want to have a ongoing story with continuity, and that's trickier to do. And and again, even then, with like callbacks. Yes, but I would argue if you wanted to do an ongoing narrative in this series, Grey Lancer would be amazing because he not, does have that cat, that supporting cast. I have not read Grey uh, Grey Lancer. Uh, Grey Lancer is. Well, he's, um, unlike D, he doesn't use a sword, he uses a lance, and that's why he's called Great Lancer. But he, uh, he, the Great Lancer is set during, like, the height of the Vampire Empire. That's a weird thing to say. It's like a prequel situation. It's very much a prequel. Um, it's like, it's like the high era of technology, you know, it does have, you know, that decadent court feel to it. Mm-hmm. And Great Lancer... Is Dracula's best killer. Okay, got it. Like, it, like it's called another vampire hunter. Great. I'd watch it. <laughs> like, I think yeah. that would actually be really good because you can get that decadent court. He does have an actual family, though. By this point, he's been just Grey Lancer for so long. Everyone calls him that. I would like the makers of Netflix's Castlevania to please license this immediately. <laughs> <laughs> Um, like, I think, yeah, like, yeah, because I, I think with, with, with D, like, the other bit with D, like, to, to get to the Clint Eastwood Western comparison, it's like, the Man with No Name series is a trilogy, like, is a trilogy, like, they only really did three of those, um, and then the High Plains Drifter, um, Pale Rider series, um, that's, again, that's two movies, um, and there's with that semi supernatural ish, potentially gunslinger. Um, like it's, uh, be, and I do think that to an extent, like while I, I, while I bet that if you, if you were to go talk to Clint Eastwood, uh, I said, do, would you want to do another movie as that character? He'd probably go. Yeah. And then he'd go, why are you in my house? Right. <laughs> Get off the um, and, but like, but it would be having the right kind of degree of story to it. Um, mm-hmm. And like all of those are to a degree 
very standalone and they don't have the recurring cast to keep a lot to to and if you're going to do again all the vamp like do a bunch of vampire hunter d novels you know, to keep them together that is i suspect also why there's only two vampire hunter d animated movies um is like and why they're so far apart if i could just because when this came out we're still in the bubble economy the bubble's still there there's plenty of money floating around if you wanted to do vamp like four more vampire hunter d movies there probably would have been the money there for it without hesitation um but i just had a genius idea you guys if i may pitch something really quick in my dream world what if the same team that made mad max fury road made a vampire hunter d movie I'd watch it. I'd watch it. That'd be pretty awesome, right? <laughs> but, I mean, you know, I watch most things, you know, directed by George Miller, so... <laughs> like, likewise, like, <laughs> like... Like, the only George Miller thing I don't want to watch is... Babe, because I went to an event in high school, like a sporting event, where for the TV in your in-between games room... Um, when I was there, it was just Babe over and over again. Are we talking about again. the one with the pig? Yeah. Yes. Oh, that was George actually Miller. a good movie. No, that was a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, it, it's, I have, it's I have seen it so many times over the course of one weekend. Yes. Too like, much. And it's always so, weird. Wait, the Mad Max guy was Babe? Yeah, <laughs> that's in my brain of movies. But yeah. yeah. You do that. But just like, the is, like, Mad Max has this thing about it, but they're really well-directed films and really well-edited. Here we wrote. Yeah. Road Warrior 2. Thunderdome is its whole own thing. And yep. the original Mad Max, the closest thing I get is, like, Evil Dead, in that it's a passion project... It's not bad, but it's got no budget. Which is fine. Yeah. So here's a question for you too. Would you be interested in seeing Vampire Hunter D in a live action format? Or do you think it would always be better animated? Um, well, okay. That, my answer is going to depend on a, a number of things. One, who the director is and how much control they have. Because this is something that can really, really easily be ruined sure. in, you know... Always a risk. Yeah. Adaptation. Uh, also, uh, like, with all, all works, I think doing as much with practical effects is always going to be better than just shooting with sand-ins and then going back digitally. Yeah. Uh, I think... But probably the absolute sense. greatest example of that is the difference between uh, the original 1981 The Thing, or was it 82? Yeah, it was 82 is The Thing, and then the 2011 The Thing, where one that was all done with practical and one that was done with digital, and the one in 80, and the original still looks better. Well, that was a masterpiece, I mean. It is a masterpiece. I just mean <coughs> the visuals of yeah, the creatures, they still look good. Yeah, I, because, I, I, yeah, yeah I, I, I think it is definitely a case of, of the director, how much control they have, and also to a degree, like, how much budget they have. Like, like, whether they have the budget to do what they need to do. That's an excellent point. Um, uh, honestly, it, like, the budget can be worked around if you, if you know what your budget is ahead of time and you plan accordingly. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Like, 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 Robert Rudd, like, if you say, hey... Robert Rodriguez is directing Vampire Hunter D. Oh, I would watch I, the fuck out I, of that I'd watch movie. That. <laughs> if, 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 you, if you told me Guillermo del Toro was doing Vampire oh, Hunter D, so cool. I would go see that movie. If you told me Eli Roth was directing Vampire Hunter D, I would go... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> An open mind, but I would not be as enthusiastic. <laughs> like, and, and if you told me Quentin Tarantino directs Vampire Hunter D. I would not I'd, watch that movie. I would not go see that film. Like, I enjoy Tarantino movies, but I would not go see Tarantino that film. Tarantino movies have a very distinctive flavor. I actually would, I would see it. Um, okay, you know, I, I say that <laughs> But, like, based on, like, the first one, he does have that sort of, as you said, sort of grindhouse feel. Yes, he's that, really good with stylization. 
Um, I, I, I don't have the emotional attachment to be that you do, so for me it would be a no-brainer, but I, I respect your hesitancy. <laughs> it's, mm, I respect it's your hesitancy on the basis of vibes alone. Like, <laughs> the problem is with a Tarantino, uh, while we would probably get a pretty good D movie, I don't think we would get an original D movie. That's fair. I think, I think a lot of what we get would probably be done better elsewhere. But you can't watch uh, Vampire Hunter be the movie that we are we've been talking about this whole time. And not with that Tarantino uh, could probably do a really good live action shot for shot remake. I absolutely well, I was gonna say you can't watch it and not pick out influences from so many different genres that I mean the originality comes in smashing them all into a hole, but if you pick it apart into pieces, you could be like, Okay, I've seen this before, I've seen that before. Well, uh, the problem <laughs> is, is that with Tarantino the pieces are a lot bigger. Usually, <laughs> yeah, and also the like, Tarantino would not do a total shot for shot remake because there's not enough feet, <laughs> insufficient feet. That's that's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, he probably would say no on that. Uh, no, he, 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 he'd oh, find a way to put a lot of D propping his feet up at times. So, <laughs> yep, but, and and but it, I, he'd, he'd find a way to, to put more feet in there. Um, Panos Kalmatatos, um, the director of Mandy. I would also see him do his take on D. Um, but like, like it, it's a very short list of directors who I'm like, okay, if I they did vamp- trust with the property. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas others, I'd be like, I'd have to see more trailers. I'd have to, like, I, I'd have to learn more about this before I would say, b- before I would automatically be buying my ticket. Mm-hmm. And that's fair. Adaptation is a risky game. And um, it, like we were just talking about the fact that studios have leaned more and more and more heavily on adaptation in the last few decades uh, has served them well and poorly in different areas. There isn't really a core of directors that I can point to and say, these guys are good at adaptation. Like it's so case by case. And I think if you get to the point of being a director, you have your own point of view and you want to express that rather than necessarily being true to an adaptation. And I understand that as a creative person. So it's it's really rough is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you are a big name director and you get attached to a big name adaptation, how much spin are you allowed to put on it? And then how worried do you have to be about the fan base coming after you for that? You know who we should ask about that? J.J. Abrams. Oh, let's, let's not. <laughs> let's not go near that person. Uh, we have feelings in this household. <laughs> we, have, we have feelings on, on mystery boxing and J.J. Abrams. Just <laughs> similar to film crit hulks, if anybody reads him. Yeah. The mystery box only works if you know what's in it ahead of time. Well, not if... If the creator knows what's in it ahead of time, the viewer shouldn't. But all decisions in narratively should. I'm getting way off topic. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Yep. Um, I think a part of the enjoyment of Vampire Hunter D actually comes from the fact that it is so heavily genre based. There are, there are certain expectations that come with those genres that they can either choose to embrace or choose to subvert. And it, it's always fun as a scholar of the media to, to watch something like that. For me, anyway, like I enjoy that. I'm like, are they going to go with the, the gothic romance kind of thing? Are they going to go with more of a straight up horror movie feel? Are they going to go with really heavy post-apocalyptic dying earth stuff? Um, it's all together. <laughs> which tropes will they keep? Which tropes will they subvert? Which tropes will they throw out? Um, for me, that's really the charm of the of the franchise. Um, but I came to it later than you did, so I think for you, it's more character based. Yeah. Well, I mean, you cannot have the character without the setting, like. D is alone. D is alone. Wanderer could be anywhere, sure. but D, the specific character, has is so built into the his his history, so built into what makes him him, is that like 
that Han Wander fights monsters, that's, I mean, if you put him in, like, the world of Witcher, I mean, figure out the backstory, that's just Geralt. That's just a Witcher. Yeah. So, like, the the, the archetype can go anywhere, but the character is sort of limited to their background. Interesting to compare to Alucard from Netflix's Castlevania series. Uh, I always thought they'd get along. Of course they'd get along. <laughs> It would be great. Uh, Dampier. Dampier. Possibly my... Twinsies! <laughs> Alucard, possibly my favorite vampire character in media ever. That specific Alucard from the Netflix Castlevania show. Just awesome. Well, do you have any final thoughts? We've been going for about an hour or so. Uh, on... I, I recommend uh, people check out the movie. Uh, if they want to read it, but they don't want to like actually read the book, there is a truly gorgeous comic book adaptation of the first novel, Fire Fire Hunter D. Um, I I will also add that the series has also received multiple uh, like uh, audiobook adaptations, which are currently still ongoing, mm-hmm. both like traditional audiobooks and uh, graphic audio, where it's a full cast audiobook recording. Mm-hmm. Um, if that's your preferred method as well. If you want something you can um, listen to while jogging or commuting to work or that sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Always nice. Yeah. Like the series has been around for quite a while since, you know, the movie's almost 40 years old and it's an adaptation itself. Um, so yeah, I, I love the series. Um, I love pretty much every incarnation it's had. And I, I would recommend if you want that sort of that, gothic horror post-apocalyptic world to check it out. I'm sorry I took the conversation in a thousand different directions this time. You were not Um, alone. (laughs) (laughs) It's partially because this series is very important to um, anime history and Japanese media history. It's partially because um, vampire stories are so interesting to talk about because they pop up all over the world and it's partially because of all the different genres um in the material and and the nature of the ways it has been adapted that is interesting to talk about so i'm sorry yet i'm not sorry Uh, i do think it is definitely a series um worth checking out if you have any interest in vampire supernatural fiction at all um definitely stands up there and i've read a lot of supernatural fiction i'm just gonna put that out there um young adult and and adults alike and you know i enjoyed both the book and the two movies so there's lots of ways to dip your toe in if you're interested in the franchise and it's worth your time yep so uh next month We have our proper inaugural installment of Nasuvember, where we will be taking a look at Tsukihime, the first anime adaptation of a work by Kyoko um, Nasu, um, and the first published visual novel by Type Moon. So that's going to be interesting to talk about. See, visual novels. That's why we had to prep you for them. (laughs) It was all (laughs) planned. Absolutely, everything is a going a cause accord. Everything is going according to Kikaku. <laughs> plan. <laughs> oh, that, that 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 brings us right back to fan translations. <laughs> yep. Well, huh. everybody have a fantastic Halloween for spooky season. Indeed. Yes. And if you enjoyed this podcast. Please, of course, get rate and review in your pod catching platform of choice. It helps us get seen. And if you want to financially help support the um, podcast, please consider backing the Patreon at patreon.com slash count zero O-R. That's count Z-E-R-O-O-R. Um, that helps cover our hosting costs, which, which which is just nice to have. Alex puts out a lot of great stuff, you guys. Check it out. Yes. All right, and we will catch you all next month.